because uh, my kids are home. That's uh, fine. Okay. And if you have to ask me any questions, you can ask me through the chat route or okay. you know, stop yes, me. Sure. Not a problem at all. No, not an issue. We all understand exactly. these are things that we grapple with. Yeah, no worries. So um, thanks for uh, the patience. And what we are looking at doing is now starting with learning outcome two. In learning outcome two, it is mostly theoretical because as you see, the key descriptors understand theories of teaching and learning. Now, there are lots of these broad theories that we do get to see, which are a part and parcel of our daily lives. So things like the motivation theory in particular, uh, you know, were invented, uh, I would say a few decades back. Maslow's work was primarily the most important one, which kind of started this as a process. There were some scientific experiments done by um, you know, um, Herzberg in, in the US when mass industrialization started to happen after World War II. And we see that, you know, these theories have become uh, part and parcel of our day-to-day -day life, especially in HR human resources. Also, we look at education and training and in other areas or disciplines wherein we need to work with people. And sometimes you have to look at keeping them motivated, um, you know, along as you, um, you know, do teaching, delivery, training, whatever it is. So we'll look at them in a bit more detail today. Um, there are some taxonomies that we need to be aware of. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy, we discussed very briefly yesterday, um, the three realms that he discussed, uh, cognitive, diagnostic, but we'll go into other details of uh, Anderson's, Plink, and Solo's taxonomy as well. These are things that we can draw inflection from while we are looking at doing preparation of lesson planning or curriculum development in general. And then we need to look at how do we plan lessons which are inclusive. So when we talk about inclusive lessons, what we are looking at is, you know, including when we generally use the word inclusive, I mean, in literal terms, we are looking at, you know, providing some of the basic services in teaching uh, that normally are expected from a teacher. But when we talk about inclusive lessons, what we are looking at is primarily uh, going into um, creating lesson plans wherein you would keep in mind the needs and requirements of every child or every learner in your classroom. And what you're doing is if you have learners in your classroom which have some specific needs or have some disability, then in those cases, you are going to be specifically charting out some activities or areas of activities that you do and conduct with other learners. And they would be looking at meeting the specific needs of uh, all the learners or in those cases, learners which have specific requirements or disabilities, and that would be what is what we call inclusive uh, lesson planning. So here, the idea would be to try and understand and you know cross-reference some part of the lesson plan that we've done in Learning Outcome 1 to basically look at tailoring it to meet the requirements of a learner which has some specific needs. Could be because of dyslexia, simple case uh, scenario, or a special needs, which could be some sort of a disability which the learner has. And what you do is you basically tailor that uh, mm -hmm. lesson plan by developing it into, uh, by, by mentioning, not developing, but mentioning a few activities which would be specifically looking at that learner so that you're able to bring that learner along with the class and uh, the teaching process of teaching and learning is happening for all the learners alike. So there are three assessment criteria, and that is what we'll be getting into today in terms of our discussion. As always, I've got a few deck of slides that I've prepared. These deck of slides primarily would focus on covering some of these in a bit more detail. And what we will look at is um, maybe also look into one or two videos uh, which will allow us to understand um, you know, some of these key concepts. Now, one of the first videos that I put is uh, put um, in primarily from the context of you know, learning style. And what I would do is um, as a general exercise, you know, learning style questionnaire, the one that we use in our organization I'm going to try and send you a quick email, um, which is basically what you can actually look at. And this learning style questionnaire is a version that we have created uh, on our website. And you'd be able to basically fill this up um, you know, electronically. And I'm going to try and show you um, a paper-based version of it as well. And that paper-based version uh, you know, should allow you to um, you know, use it. Um, there are various... Uh, formats and templates available, but generally speaking, they all help you capture, you know, one part of the specifics in terms of understanding how the learner, uh, uh, you know, how the learners are essentially looking at learning. So this is a part of the questionnaire that we have, and I've sent you a quick email right now. So when you look at this particular email, 
in general, uh, what you're going to be able to see is that learning style questionnaires, uh, you know, essentially help you with uh, understanding what is the best style through which the learner actually learns. And there are four different styles uh, we've discussed very briefly yesterday. And this is what we'll go into today as well. And they would be visual auditory, somebody who learns from reading and writing, take their own notes or make their own notes in the class. And obviously, you know, looking at kinesthetic. So these styles typically, you know, allow the teacher or the tutor or the trainer or the instructor to basically understand what is the person's, uh, you know, favorable mode of learning. And in, in the case, when we use the word kinesthetic, what we are relating to is person's awareness of the position and movement of the body or parts of the body that are used to be able to then, uh, you know, uh, let's say articulate what you're teaching and delivering. So in my teaching as well, in particular, when you are doing it in the classroom, even when I'm doing it online, I do use my hands and gestures to be able to articulate, close my eyes, or, you know, essentially look at uh, people face to face. And this is primarily done uh, because it will help uh, you or the learner essentially to, uh, you know, articulate some of the things better, which are being discussed or being, uh, you know, spoken about. So this process of using the physical uh, movements of the body or physical activity of the body, uh, specifically in subjects like physical education or PE as we do in schools, you would see that this tends to be the most important style which the learner and, and the teacher or the tutor instructor would essentially be focused on because this will help the learner understand uh, you know, various aspects of what is required to be done in physical education. Now this learning style questionnaire when you fill it up, it's a set of 31 questions, I think, um, um, or in this case, 24 questions. Sometimes they have uh, similar questions. All you have to do is there's no right and wrong answer for this. You answer these questions and what you do then do is calculate your score um, in terms of if you use the and use the option of answering the question by saying it's often, uh, then you normally add five points per question. If you would say sometimes it's three points, and when you say seldom, that means you sparingly use it or hardly use it, then it's one point. And what you do is then you total it up and that would give the, by answering this particular uh, specific set of questionnaire, it will help the help you arrive at a specific style of learning. And this specific style of learning would be taken into account when we talk about, you know, delivering sessions or teaching and learning in the classroom or even online. Now, this particular part was essentially developed by Honey and Mumford, and it is called the Learning Style Questionnaire. And this Learning Style Questionnaire, uh, you know, has is now be become an integral part of, uh, 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 as a tool of the teachers. You know, it's a tool which basically is used to assess individual preferred learning style uh, based on their, uh, you know, the questionnaire is based on helping you discover cognitive and sensory preferences of the learners. And when we use kinesthetic physical ability of the learners to be able to understand and grasp the content in the class. Now, this is specifically important when you're delivering in the classroom based setting because of the fact that you need to be able to clearly understand, you know, what are the cognitive abilities of the learner and what are the, uh, you know, physical aspects or physical abilities. And last but not the least, you know, also looking at, you know, sensory preferences. Does the user or the learner in this case see you eye to eye? Do they shy away when you are asking questions? Do they turn their face away? Now, these are things that you would be looking at understanding from a sensory perspective, but from a cognitive perspective, it's the intellectual ability, you know, of the learner to think, reason, and remember, and that would be helpful for you essentially to, um, uh, you know, decipher what is the best methodology to be able to teach and deliver these sessions in the class. Now, I've got a great video on this, uh, which has been taken up from TED Talk. Um, if I bring you back to the slide, this particular video, uh, you know, talks about the learning style and the importance of uh, discovering the learning style before you get into the class for a teacher. And it's a good watch of about, I think, eight minutes. And what I'm going to do is ask you to watch it offline. I've included a link of this, which, which, which should uh, take you straight away if you put it onto the browser to the video. And um, it's a good um, uh, video because it puts or gets gets you highlights on how do we look at learning style and why they are important? And she has, um, when we look at uh, this particular video from Tishia, 
Mashik, she has actually put up a good spin on why it is required essentially also for critical self-reflection. And um, this would give you a bit of a overarching view on what we're going to discuss in terms of, you know, the theories of teaching and learning and why they are closely associated with understanding the learning styles and learning taxonomies, which are uh, useful when you are planning your lessons. Now, um, if I look at the overview of some of the taxonomies in terms of how they've come about. So if we look at the meaning of the word taxonomy, it is a branch of science which is basically concerned with classification, you know, allows you to systematically organize or classify things in order to make it easier for people to understand. So when we look at the development of these taxonomies and the domains, there have been three in particular which, you know, uh, come across. And when we go to Bloom's taxonomy, the three aspects that we looked at yesterday um, in, in our brief discussion that I discussed was cognitive, effective and psychometer. So when we look at the origins of psychometer in particular, this is a relationship between this particular aspect of the, um, you know, the uh, classification essentially helps us understand the relationship between cognitive and physical movements. So when I say cognitive and kinesthetic, that is where the psychometer side of the classification helps us in understanding what would be useful for us in terms of our planning to plan those lessons when we, in, when we have a number of learners in the classroom. Now, this bit of work started to happen in the early 1950s. And what we do get to see is that as the time has elapsed, what has happened is a lot of different perspectives have come about. And these different perspectives that we look at in terms of uh, different learning styles and learning taxonomies, you know, is um, depicted very nicely on this particular, you know, chart, which basically tells you in what time frame and in what eras different scholars actually used different types of learning styles and how scientists came up with this particular, uh, you know, classification of taxonomies, which is then used in the teaching uh, and learning side of things. Now, the base bit that we need to look at is that the most work which essentially uh, has happened or when the, you know, when I say the origins of it Excel actually started with Bloom's taxonomy because Bloom and his team actually started work in the early 1950s. They came across with these six dimensions that we look at, which are hierarchical levels. And these hierarchical levels typically are associated with, uh, you know, the three aspects of cognitive, effective, and psychometer type of classification when we look at taxonomies. So here, what we do get to see is the six hierarchical levels that you know he came about from uh, as a pyramid, which have been depicted here. Is they started with remembering, understanding, applying, uh, application side of things, analyzing, evaluating, and then creating. So when we look at teaching children in the class or uh, you know learners essentially in a classroom, what we do get to see is we start with the fact that we start need to involve them in remembering facts and information that you are delivering. And that is the first step that we do in terms of planning our lessons is that we build the content and the resources and the activities that we are trying to do to help the learners actually uh, remember. And remembering is normally done by recalling facts and information that you're providing in terms of delivery. Now, once the learners are able to remember, then it helps to build an understanding for them to start looking at to say that you now need to go beyond remembering and collating information. You need to now understand what you've remembered and that requires you to do comprehension of concepts. That means they need to be able to comprehend and understand how this needs, why this happens, how this can happen. And you know, in some cases, when and how frequently this can happen. And that part is the understanding part. Then once you are able to understand the ideas and concepts, you are able to discuss, you are able to explain. What you then do is you go into the application side of things. That means you are applying the knowledge from what you have understood, what you have collated as information, memorized, and that goes into the application part of it to solve problems and tasks. And that is where the activities come into the classroom, wherein teachers are you know, encouraged to build activities so that in order to concretize, that means in order to ensure that the learning part of it, the information that you've delivered or the data that you've provided is now remembered. And then the application of that can be done to memorize it is done through the process of applying or uh, you know application. Once you've done the application part of it, the Bloom's taxonomy then came up and said that one of the dimensions is that you need to now apply it. 
So once you've started to apply it, what you need to do is differentiate, organize. You need to be able to go it, get into deeper understanding of why these things happen or how or what makes this thing uh, tick or work. And in those cases, you start looking at questioning techniques. You start looking at experimentation and you also look at examining by doing research and that is where the analysis part of it comes in and the next part that they came up with is evaluation so once you've been able to reason evaluate experiment and question what then you need to be able to do is evaluation is about making judgments that means by collating the data information assimilating it applying it experimenting with it comparing it and then solving some parts of the issue, what you then need to be able to do is journalize it to make judgments. That means your judgment should then be based on uh, the actual data, which has been collected, research information, which has been collected. And that is basis of forming standards and criteria, And that would allow you to make judgments uh, which are going to stand or which are going to essentially stand the test of time. So here, you're appraising, defending, judging, selecting, adjusting, and then applying to be able to get to a judgment stage. And finally, when you've had that experience of uh, making the judgment, the last dimension basically talks about, which is the highest level, talks about how students are then able to generate new ideas or construct new ideas around, uh, say, for example, any activity that has been given. And that would allow independent thinking to be put into place uh, and development of independent thinking tends to happen. And that is where Bloom's taxonomy, you know, is very important because it allows educators, teachers, instructors, trainers to be able to provide a structure or help build a structured approach, let's just put it this way, through lesson planning and in their curriculum design, which helps the student build on some of these skills, starting with remembering and going up to the creation part and that is what allows the learners to then develop what is called deeper understanding of the subject matter. So Bloom's taxonomy saw the origins of how various classification of learning techniques uh, came into being. And that is where we see uh, that Bloom's taxonomy, you know, is the fundamental model or the important uh, framework, which basically allows, learn, uh, you know, teachers or educators in this case to be able to come up with a framework that allows learning uh, to be delivered, learning to be done at different levels and in different domains, depending on the, uh, you know, cognitive as well as the physical and, uh, you know, um, let's put it this way, neural activities or the abilities of the learner. And that is why we need to understand this as a key part because this is one of the most important frameworks that we look at in the case of teaching and learning. Now. When we do talk about, uh, you know, explanations of or classifications of different other taxonomies which have also come about, what we are looking at in this case is also taking into account, uh, you know, taxonomies from Anderson. Now, when we look at um, Anderson's taxonomy, what we are looking at is understanding where his work, uh, you know, uh, went into a slightly different domain uh, from, uh, you know, Bloom's economy. Now, Anderson's taxonomy is also known as Anderson and Krathall's revised version of Bloom's taxonomy because these two scientists actually worked together to create a revision of what Benjamin Bloom had actually created. And they, uh, you know, looked at an approach of, uh, or let's put it this way, they took a more contemporary and a comprehensive approach to guide educators to be able to design effective lessons which will create experiences. And these experiences will have long lasting impressions wherein the students are able to then develop deeper understanding into any subject area. Now, Anderson's and Krathol's uh, you know, taxonomy consist of six different levels. And these six different levels that we talk about, you know, um, you know are slightly different from um, Bloom's economy because what they did was they took Bloom's work and then extended it further. Now, these six different uh, you know, um, let's put it this way, uh, levels focused on only the cognitive abilities of the um, individual. And they then further specialized in understanding that how the intellectual ability, which is basically thinking, reasoning, remembering of 
uh, learners can actually be promoted or propagated into a, a you know a effective lesson plan. And when we talk about these six different you know domains, they basically talked about or levels or domains as we call it. They were arranged in a bit of an ascending order. So they also followed what was maybe the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid, like remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. But on the other hand, what they did was they started, um, you know, basically, um, uh, let's say, categorizing them into four main domains. And these four main domains essentially, you know, were classified or called as factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge, and metacognitive, uh, you know, knowledge. Now, the creation of this particular uh, categorization along with the six domains which Bloom had suggested allowed educators to uh, you know, plan for instructions, develop assessments, and facilitate deeper learning. Now, having to say that it helps in deeper learning is maybe more uh, you know, like a wish statement. But what Anderson and Krathol did was, what they did was they, they refined the framework which allowed and facilitated deeper learning essentially to happen. So here, the categorization into four domains of actual, conceptual, procedural knowledge encouraged learners to actually engage in higher order thinking skills. And that, according to Anderson, uh, you know, facilitates critical thinking and creativity in any subject area or domain. And this is the bit which we see is slightly different when we consider Anderson's and Krathol's te taxonomy as compared to Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Krathol's work was more into what is called the effective domain. Now, if I go back to the, um, you know, the main uh, chart that I'd shown and how these taxonomies slightly differ. So, Anderson did the categorization into the cognitive domain. Krathol's work elaborated the work which was further done by Anderson into what is called the effective domain of uh, you know the classification of taxonomies that we look at. So a separate slide that I put together here is simply because of the fact that his work also led to you know uh, allowing uh, learners to be able to uh, allowing educators to understand learners' behaviors uh, along with the uh, knowledge side of things and the behaviors. Uh, to understand learners and to help them in doing, uh, you know, let's say in building skills and knowledge, it is important according to him to also understand the behavior of the learners. And behavior of the learners indicates things like attitude, awareness, attention, you know, concern, interest and responsibility. So he further categorized them into saying that in order for the learner to learn and the learning to be effective, it has to be demonstrated by behaviors which indicate uh, or have, you know, uh, indication of how aware the learner is, what is the interest of the learner, what is the attention the learner is actually paying, and, you know, what kind of responsibility will the learner essentially take towards driving independent thinking or independent learning. And this part is basically the part which is uh, the research done by Krathol, and it relates to uh, the effective uh, domain of the classification of taxonomies. And this bit, what he did was just like Anderson, he created four categories of knowledge. What Krathol did was he created these five categories of behavior and related it to some characteristics. And this, these understanding these characteristics by the educators allow them to engage more effectively with learners. Now, Sometimes we see, we often see, you know, learners' ability to listen and respond in the class or in the environment by looking at what attitude they bring to the class or what is their awareness about the session or what is their involvement in terms of, you know, the session itself that you are conducting in the class, which is basically to do with concern and atten attention and maybe their interest. And then how responsibly they are able to respond to some of the question answer sessions or you know, the reasoning part of it that you get involved while conducting these activities during the sessions. And that is what we get to see in the Krathol's work when he related it to these five different parameters. And these five parameters were essentially in the 
behavioral side of things, which he felt was more important for the educators to understand. Uh, and that is where the classification was further extended. Now, when we look at um, psychometer side of things, what we are looking at is psychometer basically, as I mentioned earlier, talks about we looking at physical movements and you know body movements uh, specifically to understand the, the concept of you know um, the the working abilities of you know how the learners would essentially be looking at um, you know um, say taking on learning and understanding within the classroom. So the physical movements part of it and the coordination using some of the motor skills areas which require you to use speed, precision, distance. And you know some of the instrumentation instruments which allow you to essentially understand how you are going to learn from things. And here is an example of looking at experimentation side of things. So when we look at doing experiments in, say, for example, chemistry lab, or when we start to do some activities wherein it involves the imagination of experimentation, and you know uh, allows or you give as a as an instructor, as a teacher, as an educator, you give the freedom to the learner to imagine and you know experiment on things. What you're looking at is you're using a psychology um, part of, uh, you know, one of the sides of psychology uh, wherein you are looking at asking the learners to use instructional design. And in some cases, uh, looking at using that instructional design to encompass development of, uh, you know, physical and motor abilities. So a classic example of this that we look at is if you look at a newborn child and by the time he comes up to an age of one, you generally see the child starts to make, make a lot of movements of hands, arms, and legs. And because there is a preparation happening to be able to start walking, there are lots of uh, you know physical and motor-related uh, uh, abilities which the child needs to develop in order to be able to take that giant step off or a big step off, you know, starting to walk rather than crawling. So these abilities which fall into uh, physical and motor abilities and are classified as that, would be termed as the psychomotor, uh, you know, uh, domain. And this particular domain essentially looks at the educational psychology, wherein learners would be looking at instructional design to develop, uh, and uh, you know, their physical and motor skills. Now, one of the three domains of Bloom's taxonomy looks at psychomotor domains, and the work which was done, uh, you know, by some of the scientists and you know, people who looked at further classification, they looked at stretching this domain by understanding how can learners acquire skills that involve physical movement, coordination, and in some cases, even motor skill development. Now, these can be done from a range of actions like grasping objects, maintaining posture in the class. And, you know, for example, sometimes you would see learners leaning or sitting towards one side their posture of the body would also be able to give you some idea in terms of how attentive they are or what is the interest they have in the lessons. And this would be used by educators to understand more uh, about the, um, you know, about the learner itself and asking the learners or engaging with the learners to be able to asking them to help them maintain posture to do, to be able to do complex tasks uh, specifically I would give an example is that when you're learning instruments or if you're a teacher, you are, uh, you know, uh, a music teacher and you're asking your learners to learn an instrument, there are certain areas in which when you have to position the instrument, like you play a guitar, your violin, or, you know, anything that you play uh, in terms of drums, there has to be a particular uh, way in which you have to maintain or sit or maintain your posture, if I may put it this way, and that would allow you to play the musical instrument or participate in sporting activities in a much more effective manner. And that would be related directly to the psychomotor domain. So when we look at different fields, different uh, you know, taxonomies here, what we are able to see is some of the three domains which Bloom talked about, uh, cognitive, we look at the uh, effective and psychomotor, they are going to be used in different educational settings and these domains would be essential for educators, teachers, instructors to be able to have, uh, to be able to understand and have, uh, let's put it this way, look at hands-on learning and help in skill development 
particularly in the field of, say, for example, for psychomotor domain, it will be in the field of physical education, healthcare, or vocational training. And that is why, you know, this bit is quite important when we look at the different classifications of, uh, you know, Bloom's taxonomy and the work which was done by, uh, I would say, different, uh, uh, you know, authors and scientists to extend this into a comprehensive classification. And that is why we call them as, you know, taxonomies. Now, one of the other things that you look at in taxonomy is the solo taxonomy, which is basically a short form for structured uh, structure of observed learning and uh, you know outcomes. So, if I just reorder this slightly to be clear, so when we look at solo taxonomy, what we are talking about is structure of observed learning outcomes. Now, what is uh, why is this important, and what is it essentially? proposing. Now, this particular model was actually proposed by Biggs and Collins in the 1980s. Now, in general, their model basically talks about intellectual development, which is concerned with assessing a particular learning uh, episode based on what the qualities of learner responses are. Now, is the, assuming you are in a class and you ask, uh, um, you know, you do you are, do ask a lot of questions to cross-check on how the learning is happening or whether the learners are able to understand what is being imparted in terms of teaching and learning. You would basically be looking at uh, checking their intellectual ability in, in terms of understanding whether they have, uh, you know, and their responses to that to understand whether they are understanding what is being taught and delivered in the class. And the quality of response that you get from the learners would also inform you in terms of feedback, whether the delivery is actually having uh, you know, an effect uh, or is, is creating a long lasting impression when it looks at understanding, applying, implementing the six uh, aspects of the Bloom's taxonomy. So here, the solo side of taxonomy classification was that it helps to present in a compelling way, the structure and complexity of how you get quality responses or you know you judge the quality of students thinking uh, into uh, you know say for example for the purposes of uh, you know study now this work by Biggs and Collins in the 1980s 1982 and there were obviously revisions to this done by Bolton and Lewis in the 1990s now what does it basically consist of so when i talk about the solo taxonomy it basically has five hierarchical levels and they created these levels which were pre-structural, unistructural, multi-structural, relational and extended abstract. Now what do these levels actually uh, you know uh, classify or what do they talk 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 to us about? Now these educational uh, you know levels or basically hierarchical levels uh, help us in understanding uh, the complexity uh, in students understanding of various subjects. That means if I was to give a task in the class, a lot of the students would do this task in different ways. But the way they would accomplish the task will also help me understand what is their understanding of the complexity of the task, because they will take different approaches. So this is used, this particular taxonomical model, the solo taxon taxonomical model is used to understand this particular uh, you know, complexity amongst the students. And they have divided into five levels. So pre-structure is, which is basically, you know, related to the fact that the student here has very limited understanding of the topic and lacks the necessary knowledge to answer questions or solve problems. So when we look at command verbs, when we look at the application of these verbs that we sometimes apply in tasks and assignments or activities that we give, this is where we see these being structured into by, uh, to a certain extent, uh, the use of solo taxonomy when we do lesson planning. Now, when we look at unistructure here, what we mean is that student at this level have gained some basic knowledge about the topic and they are able to approach it from one perspective only. That is the that is why the reason unistructure, that means they have only one aspect or have a single concept uh, or a perspective to be able to understand this. Now, this relates to the understanding aspect of the Bloom's taxonomy because they are only able to relate to information, collect facts, information, and understand it and memorize it. When we go to multi-structure, here what we'll say is the students have the acquired 
they have acquired several pieces of information or concepts and they can relate it to the topic, but they might struggle to integrate all of them to see a bigger picture. So this is related to the second part of the Bloom's taxonomy, which basically talks about, you know, after understanding, uh, you know, looking at, um, um, you know, after remembering, looking at understanding, but they might struggle with uh, understanding the bigger picture of it, uh, because there are lots of concepts and a lot of perspectives involved. That is why the term multi-structure. Now, when we talk about relational, what we mean at this stage is the students are able to make core connections between different concepts and pieces of information. And again, because they're able to make this connect and they are able to understand and put together these different pieces of information, they are able to analyze and evaluate the relationship within topics. That means they're able to apply some part of it or analyze some part of this uh, related to Bloom's taxonomy. Then the last one is uh, which they propose, Colin and Briggs, they propose extended abstract. That means the learners or students here have the highest level uh, or the ability which they not only just understand the topic in depth, but they're able to apply this uh, you know, knowledge creatively to different situations. That means if you have given them an abstract example or a situation, they would be able to apply their knowledge, information collected uh, using their creativity and imagination and this allows them to contribute to in different, in, uh, you know, contribute to different perspectives and also look at different insights, which will be useful for the purposes of, uh, you know, understanding uh, any topic or any, uh, you know, activity which has been given in the class. Now, bits and pieces of this that you look at, um, you know, can be then looked into taking further. And what we do see is another or last classification that we do see is what is called the Fink's taxonomy. Now, Fink's taxonomy is basically looking at, uh, you know, somebody from a perspective looking at is everything balanced? You know, his main uh, objective was to primarily look at that now we've got so many of different, so many different types of classification. Now, is there a way wherein Bloom's taxonomy, uh, Anderson's, Crathall's, Solos, Collins and Briggs, is there a balance? So what he did was when he looked at, uh, you know, uh, this concept in terms of, uh, you know, creating this framework, he focused on the fact that there is six, there are sometimes when you do lesson planning, there are significant learning outcomes which have to be also planned. Or And, and when we do plan this in detail, there could be significant outcomes that we could get out of that lesson planning. So Unlike traditional taxonomies, uh, which look at Bloom and others, what he looked at was he emphasized on the cognitive processes. So when we talk about the cognitive processes, the intellectual ability of reasoning, thinking, remembering, that is what he took into focus. And he said that it is in, in terms of when we look at classification and when we look at categorization, specifically in regards to educators from a classroom perspective, he said that he's more concerned with the depth and the significance of learning experiences. So his main uh, insights into this was that people learn uh, and they have lasting experiences of learning. Uh, they, 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 the experience of learning can be lasting if it is based on experiences essentially. So he helped design a categorization or a framework which is going to help educators to create more meaningful and impactful learning experiences that uh, or learning, uh, you know, uh, let's say environments, which would help them develop experiences. And as a result, their remembrance and uh, memory side of things on these would be long lasting. And when we look at his uh, model that he proposed, he talked about six categories which are shown in this particular pie chart. So he talked about foundational uh, knowledge. He talked about application. He talked about integration, human dimensions, caring, and learning how to learn. Now, each of these, uh, you know, categories or dimensions essentially focus on certain areas. And they are classified in this particular table that I put across in this slide. So his work in the 2003 and further refinements in 2009 seems to be the very latest bit of uh, taxonomical, taxonomical work that we have, uh, you know, on Bloom, Bloom's economy and focuses predominantly on the cognitive side of processes which were essentially proposed 
in in the initial beginning in the 50s, late 50s by uh, you know Benjamin Bloom. Now, what does foundational knowledge mean? He classified this as a category which involves acquiring essential facts, principles, concepts, which can be related to the subject matter. Application side of things uh, mean that learners are able to apply their knowledge to real world problems or scenarios. And this, this emphasizes practical application of knowledge. Integration, when he meant integration, he meant integration involves making connections. So it can be clearly related to radiational side of things in solo taxonomy. As you would see, more or less the frameworks are similar, but they have been built on to initial work of Bloom's uh, work, which was done in the late 50s. So integration is involving making connections between different ideas or concepts, thereby fostering a holistic understanding of the subject. Human dimension, basically, he proposed is that this is a category which basically focuses on developing interpersonal skills and intrapersonal skills, inter and intrapersonal skills, such as communication, teamwork, and self-awareness, which is very important for the educators, teachers, trainers to know when they are actually planning or, you know, uh, creating activities uh, or, you know, essentially doing lesson planning to deliver teaching and learning. Caring part of it, he mentioned, is because he said that identifying someone's feeling, interest, and values would also help the educator to es essentially explore the values, ethics, and you know what the beliefs of these students are. So here, the caring part basically is going to be related to reflection, wherein it, at some stage when we do activities or when we do you know teaching and learning, we also look at reflective practices and caring part of it encourages the students to actually focus on, you know, um, uh, exploring what are the values and ethics and social responsibility side of things, which promotes empathy and a sense of community in the classroom or in the community, essentially, when they are uh, a part and parcel of a team or a group of, uh, you know, uh, individuals learning as a team. And the last bit that he focused on was learning how to learn. So this final category he proposed was to help students become self-directed learners. And when we look at the concept of self-managed learning, SML, it can be related to this fact here that although you learn throughout your life, some part of learning can be academic, some can be vocational, and some can be self-managed. So learning how to learn is focused on the fact that students here can be directed to uh, or self-directed to learn, thereby equipping them with skills which will allow them to learn even beyond the classrooms. So this is an important fact that he, uh, you know, concluded, <coughs> sorry, and he proposed wherein he said that learning should not stop in classrooms and educators, teachers, instructors, trainers should actually uh, promote the essence of learning in, in such a way that they also incorporate learning how to learn aspect of it, which allows learning to be continued beyond classrooms when the learner has actually, uh, you know, uh, let's say completed a course or completed some part of the study in an academic year and he or she might continue learning if they have been taught how to learn on their own. And this part of Fink's taxonomy uh, you know, breaks away from the traditional taxonomy, taxonomies which are proposed by Bloom, Anderson, Krathol, Biggs and Collins. And that is why this model is slightly different because it also inflexes on the fact that learning can happen outside classrooms as well. Is that okay? Any questions on this so far? No, everything is clear. Thank you. So this part of the taxonomies is quite useful because when you sometimes teach in different setups or different institutions, you generally see the culture of the organization or the school or the place that you're teaching in, uh, you know, might sometimes differ. And in order to plan effective delivery of lessons or the content subject area that you're planning, sometimes you'll have to dip down into some of these models to look at what would be the best model suited for that particular institution. And that is where teachers are required to adapt. And adaption, adaptation can happen when you understand these taxonomy, taxonomical classifications of how they can effectively do uh, help you in doing an effective lesson planning. 
Now, with this understanding in mind, let's get into some of the assessment criteria of what we need to cover in learning outcome two. The first part talks about assessing learning styles and uh, using these taxonomies to effectively plan a lesson. Now, one part that I would suggest yet that you do is to practically do that questionnaire, which is uh, given on the website uh, and the link I've sent you on the email. And that would essentially allow you to part, uh, you know, let's say create the evidence to understand what is a learning style and why these preferred learning styles need to be understood uh, as a from a point of view of an educator or a teacher. And they would help you as a, this would be a tool that you would use to assess individuals preferred learning styles and their, uh, you know, assessing their performance. And this can be related to the use of individual learning plan, ILP. Because sometimes when you have to plan activities to, or give activities to the students to be able to improve on their skills, you would probably put activities into the ILP, which would be related to their preferred learning style. And that would be either their visual auditory, they read or write, or they basically you look at usage of, you know, physical movements or kinesthetic, uh, you know, um, ideas. And those would be the activities that you include in the individual learning plan for the learner. And that would allow the learner to, uh, you know, be engaged, will be more interested. And hopefully that would help in building of that particular uh, skill, uh, which is required uh, to be monitored and then uh, you know, let's say developed. And that is one of the reasons why we put that into an individual learning plan. So VARC model is a model that is, uh, you know, very widely understood and obviously widely appreciated because of the fact that initial bit of work on this learning style uh, and development of these learning styles was done by Honey and Mumford. And when we talk about the VARC model, we see this as a model which is now very much synonymous with uh, what model of learning, if I may put it, put it this way, is very much synonymous because um, uh, when we talk about Honey and Mumford, they created some questionnaires, but Neil Fleming, uh, you know, is accredited with developing this particular model. And this model is now more or less used as a tool to understand and assess learners' ability before even we get them into any sort of lessons or classes for the purposes of teaching and learning. And this model basically would suggest individuals' ability to be able to have, um, let's say, distinct preferences on how they acquire and process information. And it is important, and I think most certainly a starting point for any teacher when we look at, uh, you know, deploying this particular model. So why is it important for lesson planning? But when you do lesson planning, you're looking at incorporating activities that will appeal to the different types of learning styles which learners might have in the class. And this, you know, identifying these learning styles will also help you in engaging with the student more effectively. And the activities or the resources that you use to create those activities then can be planned more effectively because you would essentially know that in a class of 10 uh, students, for example, I have three learners which are more visual, I have four learners which are more auditory, I have more learn, and, and the balance three I have which are more kinesthetic. And thereby, when you do the selection of resources for delivering your teaching and learning content, you are going to create activities which will have these resources in place and thereby allowing you to engage with learners more effectively, making the lesson or the class more interesting and more engaging. Now, the learning technologies part of it, you know, is also important because this is going to help you design instructions which are going to be progressive uh, to helping the student build knowledge and furthering their cognitive abilities, which is the reasoning, uh, you know, thinking and remembering abilities of the student. Now, again, sometimes you will have a class wherein you have different types of learners, like in the hand, all the five fingers are different. Uh, you will similarly have learners with different abilities, different, uh, you know, interests, different attitudes, behaviors, and understanding and using taxonomies would be al allowing you to generally create lessons which are going to be engaging. And these lessons, if they are engaging, leads to students acquiring knowledge and helping in building their cognitive abilities. Is that okay? So I've just used two Anderson and Bloom's taxonomy here to put a bit of an example to say that these two taxonomies can be used in 
you know, creating uh, good lessons or doing assessments with learners by using instructional activities, and thereby this will help in developing learners' knowledge and also engaging with them to basically reason, uh, remember, and you know, essentially. Um, um, so when I say reason, remember, and essentially also look at the way wherein they are going to, uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, think in the class in and that. If if let let me rephrase and put that. So if you know. Uh, the way in which the learners are going to engage with you, this is going to further help you to engage with them and touch on some of their abilities, which could be uh, categorized as reasoning abilities, thinking abilities, or remembering abilities. And this part of it is going to be important and related to, you know, the taxonomical part. And that would be, I would say, why you need to know the learning style models introduced by Fleming and the taxonomies, thereby using them to effectively engage with the learner and tailor some of your teaching methods uh, in a way which will cater to various types of learning styles, thereby enhancing the overall experience uh, you know, for learners in the classroom. Is that okay? Any yeah. questions on this assessment criteria number 2.1? No, no questions. Okay. The second part talks about explaining how lessons incorporate learning style and taxonomies. Now, having theory is great. You know, I'm I'm a great proponent that having theory is great. That's fine. I know so much about it and that is fine. But how do I underpin or use this theoretical concept in designing a better learning uh, uh, environment or creating a better learning plan, which is going to be based on my scheme of work? But I need to look at an overall picture. So how do I look at all these theoretical models and then look at the content that I have to teach and deliver? But I want to make now a bridge between the two to understand what parts of it I can use and then practically implement in the classroom. And that is the bit and the essence of this second assessment criteria that although saying it that I understand all these is good, but at the end of the day, how do I put this into practice? How do I make an effective lesson plan which is going to look at usage of some of these uh, work style model learning styles and also the taxonomical uh, you know classification so here when we look at um, doing this what we need to do is visualize how are we going to say for example uh, you know conduct a particular session and the best way to do this is by looking at uh, you know visualizing that if i was to look at learning styles what kind of things would it give me or abilities or information that it would give me that would help me essentially uh, engage, let's say more effectively with my learners. So in this case, when I look at lesson plan, which is one of the essential tools that I use to impart education or deliver my teaching, I want to be able to look at using an effective instructional design or a model, which will allow me to uh, you know, uh, let's say, engage with diverse learners in the class and at the same time, help me and the learners to understand the topics that I'm delivering. So what I would do first is, if I have 10 students in the class and this is a, a situation where we need to imagine a bit that I've got 10 learners in the class, I've got five boys and, uh, you know, five girls um, and I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher which is basically teaching English, for example. Now, when I look at this, I need consciously or subconsciously, I'm taking some of these things into mind. For example, I've taken the gender. I've looked at now within the, the students I have in the class, some students seem to be sharper, some seem to be slightly laid back, some seem to be slightly lazy. And some students essentially we feel that we need to, we will need to work on because their abilities or skill set is lacking at the level at which they are actually studying in the class. Now, once I've identified some of these important factors, what I would then want to do is look at understanding what would help me engage better with these learners. So how would I find that out? I would need to go into learning styles. Some learners, I will need to use visual props or you know uh, some of the visual props that I can use in the class 
which would get them engaged or instantly switched on with what I'm trying to teach or, you know, ask them to learn. So sometimes you would see teachers use buzzers, the switch, you know, small, um, uh, let's say props in the class, which they ask, can you pass it after having a look? Can you pass it to your next? Can you pass it to the next student? Can you pass? So what you do is you get an engagement or an activity going in the class by asking them to basically feel the prop or start to use it or understand what this does. Then sometimes we give printouts. So what we'll say is look at this diagram, look at this particular uh, picture. And then once you've uh, looked at it and you made a few points, pass it to the next student. So what you're essentially doing is using physical props, visual props, and verbal communication to be able to understand what style at which, what is the style through which you are able to engage with that learner. You see a spark in their eyes, you see they're smiling, they get suddenly, uh, you know, they are sitting up, up front to be able to engage or waiting for that to come to them on their table. And that would allow you to understand their learning styles. And these are, these are clues that you're going to pick up and will help you understand what activities they should be a part of which will help them engage with you more and thereby having an interest in doing that activity. So learning styles would be useful there to help you recognize the way in which you can engage with the learner effectively. How can you then, you know, switch them on uh, by using different, uh, you know, um, by understanding the different styles. And this would be one of the valuable tools that you would use in essentially creating a, a lesson plan. And that lesson plan would be, if for example, today in the English lesson plan, I'm delivering or talking about punctuation. So, or if I'm talking about say comprehension, then I would need to have activities which are going to be then able to engage with these learners on that front. Now, let's look at, so here learning styles would become important because you look at learning styles, then go into visual learners, or learners who are auditory and kinesthetic, and by incorporating activities which align to these different learning styles, your lesson plan would be more inclusive and engaging with all the learners in the classroom. You're not looking at just somebody who's looking at PowerPoint slides or just looking at you know the uh, you know the interactive smart board or the projector, and then they would sometimes you would feel the learners are feeling sleepy, lazy, they are leaning back on the chair. And that would give you an indication very clearly as a teacher that, okay, I need to now break this activity in, break this up and do an activity. And that activity would help me engage with some of the learners who are slouching or who are not paying attention, uh, not paying attention, and their interest is on the decline. And that would be the importance of lesson planning, incorporating learning styles. Now, let's look at in practice how would this happen when you look at taxonomies. So we know what you can use as props or, uh, you know, let's say strategies to be able to engage with the students when you know their learning style. Now, how would I look at taxonomies? Now, taxonomies here, as you know, have provided us a bit of a framework to understand what are the learning objectives and how we relate these learning objectives to their cognitive abilities. Learning objectives, in certain cases, when you teach and deliver, it's mostly understanding, then it is memorizing, then it is analyzing, then it is evaluating, and then it is creating. So the six phases of Bloom's taxonomy. Now, when you know that, you are going to then progressively make your lesson plan in such a way that the first one, two, three lessons would be more based on what is called, you know, in the Bloom's taxonomy, if you recall, they'll be more based on what is called importance of remembering. Once they remember, next two, three lessons that you're going to do is going to be understanding. Then you're going to build that up into application uh, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Now, when we do this in practice, what you're using is essentially using the taxonomies to be able to understand what kind of instructions and what is the level of complexity that you're going to build into activities from time to time to be able to help the learners engage at the cognitive level with you which is basically talking about remembering, reasoning. So first is think, uh, thinking, then remembering, and, uh, and then basically reasoning. And that it will uh, itself would allow you to, uh, let's say, for instance, use some of the lower order or lower level cognitive skills like remembering and understanding, but they then may be used to address 
other introductory activities that you're going to do in the class, which will be which will require higher order skills uh, on the cognitive side, things like analyzing, evaluating, and creating, and they can be then incorporated into what are called advanced lessons. So I won't start something very, uh, you know, if I'm starting something today, I will keep it easy, keep it, uh, you know, at a level wherein it creates interest, arouses interest, builds a relationship with you, uh, with the student, and then engages them. And then slowly and gradually, as you can see that the learning curve is increasing, they are engaging more with you. And what you do is then slightly start to increase the complexity uh, of activities that you do or the planning that you do in order to engage with their higher order cognitive skills, which will help them develop analyzing, evaluating, and also creating, uh, you know, these uh, uh, creating things while they are studying with you in the class. And that will make the lessons much more integrated and much more engaging, uh, uh, thereby also helping the student to essentially, uh, let's say, uh, learn more comprehensively. Some part of the lessons that you can design could be based on experiential, experiential learning. That means you'll ask them to physically carry out some of the tasks or activities, and they would then be used as best practices, and that would ensure that the lesson planning or the teaching and learning that you've done using uh, that part of the activities are tailored to facilitate more effective learning and learning experiences with the learners, and thereby using taxonomy and taxonomical models to essentially facilitate higher order learning with the students. Is that okay? Any questions on this? No. Okay, so the last assessment criteria that we look at is explaining how do we ensure the lesson plans are, or the planning that you do is inclusive. As I mentioned to you in the start, what we when we talk about inclusive is we are looking at including everybody in the class. Everybody should be participating. Now, a practical example that I'll give you here is when we have Ofsted observations or teaching observations, the inspectors from Ofsted are very clear in uh, you know doing a 45-minute teaching observation. And the teaching observation they do, they want a lesson plan before they get into that teaching observation. Most inspectors of uh, or most times when you'll have somebody observing you or teaching and giving you feedback on your teaching by doing a TO or a PO, teaching observation or a peer observation, what they will do is they will first ask you to provide them a scheme of work. And within that scheme of work, what lesson are they going to observe you is going to be required to be provided. Now, that would mean that the Ofsted inspector who is trained uh, as an aspect of understanding using the Ofsted scale to look at how effective the teaching and learning is in the classroom, they are going to look at the lesson plan and then relate it to what is required in terms of activities uh, or in terms of instructional design to be able to deliver it effectively as a plan, as a lesson. Now, when they do so, what they are looking at is they are looking at how you prepare the classroom. How uh, are you interacting with the learners? Are all the learners interacting with you? Are you able to get the weakest link in the class or the learner, which is probably a bit uh, distracted or not included in the activities? Are you able to take that learner along with you? And then last but not the least, they are going to look at it from this point of view that when you taught, when you delivered the lesson or when you did your session, was there an engagement from each and everyone in the class up according to their abilities? And that would give them a sense of how, uh, uh, you know, how brilliant you, uh, as a teacher, as a lecturer, as a tutor you are. Because if you're able to understand and get everyone going in the class to be able to, you know, engage with them and use varying forms of, uh, you know, varying forms of assessments or varying forms of engagement with them, then it gives them an idea, a very good idea that as a teacher, or as a tutor, you are quite effective. Now, when we talk about inclusive learning uh, in general, what we are also looking at is an inclusive lesson plan, um, you know, is an essential requirement of, uh, you know, any sort of contemporary education because it is aimed at accommodating the diverse needs of students or learners. And this includes people with disabilities or diverse learning styles. Now, in order to have and ensure that you have an inclusive lesson plan, 
educators in this case are expected and uh, you know are requested to cover several key aspects in designing their uh, you know delivery now one of, and these several aspects can vary some of these aspects would be to understand student needs which is where the uh, you know the learning style or what learning style model comes in they will also need to look at what is the uh, uh, medium of instruction whether you're using uh, a whiteboard whether you're using an interactive board you're using any sort of props or you know material which is going to be circulated in the class and that would allow differentiated instruction to be uh, used as a method for delivering the content uh, you know uh, for that particular session they might also look at um, you know asking you to look at collaborative techniques that means will learners or students be asked to collaborate uh, will there be a support staff present in the classroom in case if there are people or students with disabilities or special needs you know when i say special needs what i mean by that is if if there are learners which have certain disabilities would they need somebody uh, assisting them to be able to uh, you know participate in the activities in the class and would they need any sort of assistance to be able to then uh, you know participate uh, while while you are conducting the lessons you'd also be looking at things like you know inclusive language that means use of language and examples that that you do as a teacher as a tutor as a educator is going to be respectful and is going to be considerate of any sort of diversity uh, you know which is going to uh, relate to the student from the in terms of their backgrounds they come from and you are going to be looking at uh, using courteous language respectful language or being respectful in order to being able to you know plan your sessions and then we will also look at the example of you know including what is called uh, multicultural perspectives sometimes when we look at teachers educators they give lots of examples they talk about different aspects of uh, you know how lessons can be done and delivered but they are looking at you know only using material or uh, reflect on certain types of background only sometimes it can be seen as that okay i pick on a certain type of example always but there needs to be a bit of a rotation on those as well which allows and shows that there is a multicultural perspective that you have taken into account when you are discussing uh, you know examples within the classroom as well and that allows different learners to engage with you uh, you know on that perspective so for example if your class consists of boys and girls they come from you know different backgrounds different cultures they are people uh, or you know boys and girls are studying but some of them are immigrants to a particular country or they come from a different cultural background then sometimes picking up examples to include uh, you know uh, let's say um, uh, you know different cultural perspectives is going to be important from a from a perspective of uh, you know, showing that you are able to understand the different perspectives of uh, different learners or different students coming from different backgrounds. And then last but not the least, one of the aspects that we look at in terms of, you know, how you look at uh, ensuring your lesson plans are inclusive. In this case, what I would suggest is that schools or institutions also put in a lot of investment on training and development. And they ensure that their teachers, tutors, educators are also being professionally trained and they're maintaining what is called a CPD, career professional development, which basically keeps them, uh, uh, you know, keeps them having uh, their skills, uh, sharpest skills or uh, the skills which are essentially, you know, at par or in time in, in relation to the times in which they are teaching and delivering in the class. And teacher training uh, tends to be an investment which uh, can be seen uh, as a as a big reason to enhance the skills which are required in developing what is called inclusive teaching strategies. So by following some of these guidelines or you know perspectives, what will happen is that the teachers are going to be able to uh, you know ensure that uh, there is an effective lesson planning and the learners are able to actually learn from what they have act, uh, actually studied. And, and and then to a certain extent, what I'll put it this way is that this would going this is going to be uh, maybe you helping the teacher uh, deliver an effective lesson or an effective session in the class. 
just to summarize, maybe an example that I would give, say for example, of an inclusive lesson plan might be that the, the teacher, the tutor, the educator is basically looking at using a combination of say visual aids, uh, some hands-on activities, which is going to be planned in the classroom and some verbal explanations that are going to be used to ensure that all students, regardless of their learning style, can actually grasp the content which I'm trying to deliver. And in this case, what you're looking at is, uh, you know, we could maybe provide some additional time, uh, you know, to uh, students with disabilities and probably diverse, uh, you know, needs, because this would show that you are creating an inclusive classroom. This will also show that your lesson planning that you've done is inclusive. You're embracing diversity in the classroom. You're acknowledging individual differences, and you're also adopting strategies to ensure that every student has the uh, best, most, or equal most opportunity to actually succeed. Is that okay? Any questions on this so far? No, no questions. Okay, so that brings us to the end of you know today's uh, discussion on learning outcome two. Now, um, what I would suggest the key takeaway from this particular session today is to understand work learn work models of learning, which is uh, introduced by Fleming, and the various taxonomies, and how these two frameworks can help you in define designing an effective lesson plan. What does that mean? Because lesson planning is a word which is going to be used and overused in, this, in these sessions. So I would say that will effectively help you organize your class in a manner that is going to be useful for the students, interesting, engaging, and would allow you to engage with them and then thereby helping them to remember uh, what, what you have delivered and what you imparted in today's session. And though that is the aspect that you need to you know, understand by looking at the VARC model or learning styles and uh, you know, the taxonomies, which are different taxonomies proposed by different author, authors and you know, in this case, different scientists and uh, you know, the work which has been done from 1950s by Bloom to look at Fink's work as late as 2009. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Good stuff. So we'll catch up now next week to discuss, uh, you know, obviously um, uh, the learning outcome three and four. And then um, if time permits, you know, on Friday, if you're available, we'll try and, you know, wrap up this unit. But by tomorrow, what I'm going to try and do is obviously send across, um, you know, uh, a sampler uh, of this unit's assignment, which will give you um, an idea in terms of before you go and go out and do any sort of a rework, I think it should give you a good idea in terms of what is required to be done uh, to be able to accomplish this particular unit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Thanks, Fatima. I'll put this session also on the Moodle so that if you need to revisit and look at the discussion that we've had today, so you'll be able to access the copy of the recording uh, from Moodle itself. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.